All right, you ready to go? I am. All right, welcome everybody to this episode of the Renegade HPG podcast. This is Travis, and today my guest is James Ernest. James is the owner and lead designer of Cheap Ass Games and uh, has a little bit of unique insight into some uh, some Battletech history, which we're going to kind of start our conversation off with today and use that as kind of a jumping off point to talk about uh, game design in general. But uh, James, I uh, pulled your name. There was a, a little thread on the uh, Battletech CCG Facebook page, which uh-huh. was a letter that you had written probably two decades ago talking about the the early development of Battletech CCG and kind of how you were involved in the first iteration of that game before kind of a, a legal and stuff was uh, caused it to be scrapped and turned over to Richard Garfield, who was the eventual designer. So uh, so I'm a little curious. I've done some more content <laughs> on the, uh, the Battletech CCG to get, and, you know, I think the people in the group would have a little bit of a kind of you know, fun little trip down history lane and kind of see maybe a what if, you know, what that game looked like. And, and, uh, well, you know, honestly, been. uh, it's, it's been so long. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, I think that letter might know more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I should bring it up as kind of a reference here, but, uh, but yeah, so what I was gathering from it was that, uh, you know, you guys had mostly a fully formed game, you know, uh, built and sort of ready to go. Before. Yeah. Um, so I'm going entirely on seat of the pants recollection here. Um, yeah. For instance, I don't recall writing that letter, but uh, I recall <laughs> sure. writing a, a fairly uh, more uh, angrily worded letter to uh, some higher ups at Wizards. But yeah. no, the uh, to, to sort of just restate what you did um, in the in the early days of Magic the Gathering, uh, the the Gen Con when they released it in 93, uh, Wizards employees went around to all the big game publishers at the time and said, mm-hmm. Hey, let's work together. Let's do a deal because this trading card game thing is going to work out. And we want the next one we make to be even bigger. And so they signed a bunch of licenses, including Battletech um, and Netrunner and Vampire uh, the Masquerade, and thought that one of those games had the potential, being a licensed game, to be even bigger than Magic. Of course, Mm -hmm. you know, fast forward to six or eight months later, and it's like, well, we're flying with this elephant on our back now. We have Magic is doing just fine without a license. But we have contracts and we have to make all these other games. And it turned into from, and this, you know, this is just my recollection of it, but it turned from an opportunity for growth to a serious paperweight. And um, so over those next few months and years, they uh, fulfilled their contractual obligations to make the Netrunner game and the Battletech game and the, the, the Vampire game. And um, I was working at Wizards first as a freelancer, as a technical writer and uh, graphic designer, and then in-house as essentially same. And so I had a desk in the uh, newsletter department. And once in a while, uh, someone from Wizards would walk past my desk and say, hey, you get, you design games, right? And I'm like, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, uh, can you help me with this project? And one of those times was Glenn Elliott, who had been uh, given the Battletech CCG. So Glenn was... Uh, I believe one of Peter's old friends, Peter Atkinson's friends from a previous employment and came aboard to, uh, to work on the, the business end of making board games. They had done a little internal contest, I guess, or I, I don't know, a, a request for proposals internally to say who among us can make this Battletech CCG. Glenn had taken that job, had done fully functional first draft, but then sort of felt stuck. And that was when he came by my desk and said, what can you do for me? So at that point, I became essentially a freelancer under him to do support work, make playtest cards and make suggestions on rules and so forth and do internal playtesting of this Battletech card game, which we did for about a month. Um, And then uh, at least the way I heard it, essentially Fossa got word of this arrangement and said, no, no, this contract that we have with you says that Richard Garfield is going to design this game. And so wizard said to Glenn, sorry, you can't have this job anymore. And Glenn was like, okay, you're still paying me. So whatever. Yeah. And, and that meant that I got fired off that project too. <laughs> <laughs> so for all the worst reasons, the game that we made, uh, uh, technically doesn't, didn't come out, but then of course, being the same property and based on what little everyone knew about trading card games at the time, the final project was reasonably similar to the one that we had made. The only difference being that 
our names weren't on it and we didn't get paid. <laughs> oh boy. Well, hopefully you got paid till the time that they let you go. But uh well, I again I was uh I was just freelancing for Glenn. So no, I made zero money on that project. Oh my it goodness. Was more uh, you know, when you're when you're new in the industry and trying to get work, you do a lot of stuff on spec and and yeah. and things fall apart sometimes. So that's I mean, terrible, but but uh, yeah, that's how it went. I'm curious, you know, if where if you even remember as such so long ago, but you know, any kind of core mechanics that kind of stood out, or uh, you know, more themes in the game. And, I, uh, I am racking my brain uh, as to how that thing worked. The one thing that I remember I, that I think we did in our game, mm-hmm. and see, I haven't played the new BattleTech game, so you can tell me if this is the way it's. By new, I mean you know the one that happened two months later. Right. Um, well, that's good because the, then you the can't you can't claim we... your piggybacking, right? You know, if you. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't played the new game, then anything you come up with, that's the same. You know, we know exactly. It's a I, I need to claim ignorance on all counts. I've never looked at the patent office. I've never played another board game in my life. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's just start from that. Um, no, the the one thing that I think I took away from our BattleTech CCG construction was that we did a game where instead of in Magic the Gathering, where you have several phases in, in a row, all packed into the same turn, we tried a game where you could pick one of those phases and just do that. And it meant that the turn went back and forth a lot faster. But um, the only reason that I know that is because I did a similar thing in a CCG that I made through Cheap Ass, which was called Fight City. Okay. And so I can talk about Fight City with a little more clarity. Um, in that game, there is essentially three different types of turns that you can take. Mm-hmm. It is not a draw phase followed by a plague, uh, you know, con- a construction phase followed by a fighting phase. It's one of those three things. And it means you could take three fighting phases in a row, except that the other guy gets three turns too. And I think that that made the game a lot faster. Generally speaking, you know, this is just knowledge that we know from designing all kinds of board games. But if you take a multi-phase turn and, and break it up into many smaller turns, Mm -hmm. the game just goes faster. Everyone gets through it quicker. And, uh, and so that was an interesting experiment in Battletech. It turned into a thing that I did in Fight City, and it's a thing that I would love to see again in uh, in a future project. Yeah, I'm familiar with that concept, you know, from having played Star Wars Destiny when that was out of that back and forth and just how engaged it kind of kept you. And, and it's interesting you point that out because for me, you know, when I'm playing board games in general, that's kind of the biggest the biggest draw or turnoff for me is kind of just that downtime while you're waiting for other people, you know, and kind of, it seems like exactly. The, and the and richer, and the more they can yeah. do on their turn, the less you can even plan for yours, especially yeah. if it's a big interactive game where I don't really know what the lay of the land is going to be until it, literally my turn starts. So yeah, yeah. that downtime is, is critical. If, you know, just sort of game design 101, if you're designing a game for a lot of people, Mm-hmm. let them all take their turn at the same time, right? I mean, that's how Robo Rally works, for instance. We all do most of our thinking simultaneously, and then there's an execution phase that's sort of basically barely turn-based, but we're all really going all at once. And that mm-hmm. keeps everyone engaged all the time, whereas if you played, you say, Magic with five people, which we certainly did a lot of back then, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's, that's 4X downtime. That's just, you know, looking at your cards and, and waiting for, for 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember, you know, with that original iteration, was the the focus kind of on heavily on mechs? And and do you remember how you kind of, you know, translated those mechs to the cards? And, uh, you know, one thing, if, you know, looking back for myself, if I had a chance to kind of redo and uh, reapproach the game, it would almost take it more like uh, the how the Star Wars CCG went, where you could it, you could decide if you wanted vehicle based or you know, starship based or, or planet and character based and Battletech kind of has, has a very similar balance, certainly in the lore in terms of, you know, a full balance between the characters and the richness of the characters, as well as the technology and equipment. And it seemed like the, the, the game that Richard eventually came up with, you know, the, the characters were very much kind of a side thing and not even to a degree playable at a certain level because they just didn't blend very well with the, with the mechs. And I'm curious if, if your original iteration, you know, how you kind of dealt with that, if you even remember kind of the questions. I, I think, that, and again, this is 25-year-old plus reckoning here, but yeah. um, we, we mostly, I, I remember all the cards and they were mechs. They were, they were yeah. straight up mechs. And it was, you know, I think when you're going to do a game that, that doesn't, bloat you want to pick a, a cross-section and play that thing yeah. so yeah i agree like the stories are great um 
And even the planetary level conflicts are interesting, but I think as a metagame that might work, but as all part of the same layered game, that's a lot to pack in, especially if you want a game that plays fast. So yeah, we had Definitely. mechs deploying and ranks jumping out of your hand and into play and being, you know, in the front or the back end and having ranged attacks and things like that. I mean, it was very much on the sort of combat unit level. Each card was a, was a mech basically. Definitely. Yeah, I just that that back and forth is interesting because and how it translates the tabletop because the tabletop has initiative and basically people take turns back and forth and that's something that didn't did not get translated into Richard's final version. You know where it is kind of one person goes through yeah, the whole time. Uh, yeah, I think but. you shouldn't think of a CCG as an adaptation of an existing game mechanic. It's more this is yeah. a new game mechanic that tells totally. a similar story, right? So yeah. in this. In this world, in this trading card game world, I want to be able to carry a deck in my pocket mm-hmm. and and sit down in, in a line at a convention and play a game in 10 minutes with a friend of mine like on the floor. And so, chop, chop, you don't have a lot of time. You don't have yeah. a lot of rules. You don't even have a lot of space. Um, again, this is the theoretical envelope in which CCGs are being developed in 1994, right? right. Uh, it's still a real quick play pocket size game. And so, yeah, you have to pick a cross section and, and, and do that. I'm curious, you know, and a little insight into that history, you know, you were really on the ground level of kind of the explosion of the, you know, the card game, you know, what, uh, you know, any insights that you can kind of share from that. And I'm, I'm curious kind of how it shaped your personal development kind of as you grew at Wizards and then, you know, eventually came into cheap ass games. Yeah, well, building magic decks taught me how to build decks for anything. So yeah. a, a board game that has a deck of cards in it everything that you learn about how many of each card to put in and what to expect in a random shuffle and, you know, how the cards interact and, and, you know, more rare cards and less common cards are sorry, backwards, like everything you learn about building decks in a CCG, just as a player, uh, it strongly informs how you construct new decks for games that, that have similar behaviors, whether they're constructible or, or just fix right um yeah. but like kill dr lucky was one of the first products that i did through cheap ass games and that's got a deck of 96 cards and the balance of weapons and and failure cards and move cards and so on like the way those cards are distributed through that deck um is informed by how i learned how to build magic decks i you know i, I and i know that's that sounds like over simple like of course you can make a deck of cards for a card game without like needing to know how to make a ccg but um but I think that was kind of my uh, invitation to a better level of game design, like just sort of understanding how to build magic decks is a, is a huge deal. Right. And in the modern, you know, card game landscape, you know, there's a, there's a strong, strong pairing between draft play and constructed play. And I'm curious kind of how that, how and when that kind of evolved from the game design aspect and, and when, I guess you guys were forced to really kind of consider in that, that play testing design developments of those two different formats and how they interact with each other and how to kind of design cards that could be effective in both. Well, well, to be fair, I was never part of you guys. I was always kind of on the outside of that. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I know the, I know what I can say about how uh, it evolved looking essentially from, from next door, but I was not mm-hmm. on any design team for, gotcha. uh, for a yeah. magic expansion. And I, I we certainly tried to be, in fact, um, uh, one of my earliest pitches to Wizards was a, a CCG for kids, which they uh, initially asked for. And then, like I said, with all the uh, obligations that they had already signed up for, they realized they couldn't make it. Yeah. So that was, uh, that was a disappointment. But that's as close as I got. I certainly like was play testing all of those sets, but I wasn't a designer on any of them. The okay. closest thing I got to design at Wizards was uh, compiling a list of multiplayer variants for the Pocket Player's Guide. The, okay. the booklet that uh, that came out with uh, uh, revised maybe around about that time. Okay, so revised. That was the fourth one. The fourth one, alpha, beta, unlimited, revised. Yeah, sounds, sounds right. right. Um, but uh, you know, just speaking to the development of of draft play and 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 that it seems like in an environment where the you're perpetually buying the game, mm-hmm. and the person with the most cards has the best choice. And, you know, essentially the, the theory becomes that the moneyed players win. Yeah. The notion of playing from a fixed set of starter components to have a level playing field again is kind of like the notion of table stakes poker, right? Everyone can only buy in for $2. Mm. That's what you have to play with. Make the most of that. Yeah. And that translates to CCGs as saying, okay, I have all every card in your collection. You've been collecting them longer than I have. There's no way I'm catching up. So instead, let's start with a new you know, we, we'd all know we're going to buy some of the new set. So let's all buy X amount of the new set 
and play with that. And that'll be fair again. Uh, as a CCG designer, you have to say, okay, well, we know now that people are playing that way. And so we're even more terrified than ever of cards, which individually are so out of whack that whoever gets that card just wins the draft. Right. Right. Definitely. And, you know, Tata, I'm curious about your evolution kind of in, in your own and where you took that experience at Wizards into your own experience and, and you know, maybe use that as a chance to tell us a little bit about Cheap Ass Games and kind of what that company's been focused on and the type of games that you've been developing since. Well, uh, Cheap Ass came out of a pitch that I actually did uh, to other game companies at the time, including Wizards. And the pitch was sort of a Razor and Razor Blades or PlayStation and, and Discs kind of approach where you would sell a box of high quality game components that were generic enough to use for lots of board games. So it mm-hmm. really started around that tackle box, that hundred dollar box of poker chips, play money, tokens, pawns, dice that you buy once. And then the board games that, that played with it would cost like 15 or 20 bucks. Yeah. Like it was an investment that eventually paid off in lots of, of, uh, of fungible games. Um, it was a pitch, uh, you know, uh, it, it didn't get any interest. And then I, uh, I, I found myself not at Wizards and, and freelancing with a lot of games that I wanted to sell and no real way to sell them. Not a lot of, you know, clout in the industry or friends that could, you know, bootstrap a dozen games out of my briefcase. And so I said, OK, I'll just make them myself. The cheap ass games idea started with that razor and razor blades thing, except I couldn't afford to make the razor. And so I just started making the blades and said, all right, people, you probably have dice in your house. Like many other developments in game marketing over the last 50 years, that was based on my experience with D&D, right? D&D sold the books uh, separate from the dice and go get your miniatures and your dice and your whatevers. We just buy sell you the books. And so Cheap Ass was kind of the same way. We're just going to sell you the boards and the rules and the things that this game desperately needs. And we're going to craft them to use generic components like dice that if you if you have nice dice great if you have terrible dice great too but whatever it is we're not going to deal with it it's 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 your problem and that was a way for me to essentially bootstrap a game company for, with no money i you know to print my first products on my laser printer and put them in envelopes that i got at the office depot and take them to a con and and cross my fingers <laughs> right <laughs> well, interesting. i mean just uh yeah i've been um you know, think for me and in, in, in Renegade HPG, you know, so many of the conversations I have are just kind of looking at behind the scenes for that creative process. And, and I'm curious to kind of the challenges that, that you face and what you've learned and how you've learned it in your own developments, you know, through, through the game design. And I know, you know, there's, there's the Battletech fandom is big enough now that there's, there's certainly enough people who have thought, you know, kind of about, you know, have this idea for a game, you know, and I think, well, everybody has ideas. I always say kind of there's a big difference between having an idea and executing on an idea. But uh, for those that that have that idea and maybe have that ambition to kind of execute, you know, what is what have you learned along the way in terms of uh, translating and the kind of the do's and don'ts for kind of those those early gamers and, and how to get started? I think if you want to get started as a game designer, the first thing you need to do very intentionally is to separate your desire to design games from your desire to design games you can sell. Mm. And the reason that I say that is we all sort of are exposed to a culture of retail products. And that's how we see, and I'm not successful in making a game unless it winds up on the shelf at my local game store. But yeah. I think that is a, it's such a big uh, extra that, that weighs you down. It's like saying that I, I want to make a, a AAA video game or I want to make a feature film like, of course you do want to make those things eventually, but you can't do it all at once. You can't go to film school uh, and hope and expect to make the Marvel cinematic universe. That's like way out of your league. Right. And and similarly Mm -hmm. making a Gloomhaven, not just mechanically, but like the physical components and the marketing and the the presentation and the distribution and the business back end of that is so much nastier than just make a game that you, you can enjoy playing with your friends. And so like, that's the first thing I try to teach people is that your first customer is you, your second customer is the people you play every day. And way down the line, your customers are going to be, you know, publishers and distributors and retail stores and 
this to God customers, right? But yeah. if you if you're fixated on the business end first, maybe you should start a game company, but it doesn't mean you should also be designing games. Doing both is way too much work. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For me, I would I would definitely be bringing in the uh, the business side experience rather than the, the game design experience. But yeah, um, and what I'm doing now, like Cheap Ass Games is, is in St. Louis now. I don't really take much I have a hand in it. I'm kind of doing that again. I'm doing Crab Fragment Labs, which is a springboard for new ideas but like i'm not dealing with manufacturing at all uh some of our games can be done on a print on demand site called drive through cards but most of them are all just print and play like this is a game full stop play it enjoy it send us a dollar if you like it uh but that is kind of liberating because now i can just not worry about who's what what publisher i have to satisfy or right. or you know what that de- what print deadline i have to make or whether my Games are going to be stuck in a thousand okay. ship back up at LA, right? Yeah, like, no uh, kidding, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> well, what are, what are you playing? Like, what do you what do you put on the table? You know, most often these days, or, or are you stuck in kind of the design? Um, I am playing a lot of I'm playing a lot of video games. I'm still playing a lot of Animal Crossing. It's a fun toy. Um, yeah. You know, I I play casino games on my handheld, and uh, mostly what I'm spreading on the table is stuff that I'm working on. Like, yeah. that's just. Uh, that's always been the majority of what gets played in my house is games that are not done yet. (laughs) (laughs) And and that's weird because like what that, the the frame of mind that puts me in is I'm no fun to play a board game with, because if you break out quacks of Quiddling Quiddling or whatever, you know, and, and, and we play that, I'm going to spend the whole game talking about how it could have been better because that's the mindset that I'm at. Like I'm always editing. I'm always fixing. I'm always why, why is this rule like this? Why is this character like this? Everything is why with me. And if you're a player, like, like the way I enjoy movies is to sit back and let, well, let them flow over me. And so, cause I'm not a movie maker. Right. But yeah. as a game designer, my, my experience with every new game is I, I, I treat it like it's still in play test. Yeah. Now do you, is that, is your family, your play test group, or you got a group of friends there that you're able to, uh, uh, well, that COVID has sort of screwed up everything. Uh, yeah. My daughter, Nora is definitely my most frequent play tester now. Cause we are in the same bubble, but, uh, previously to that, uh, for, for the entire lifespan of cheap ass games, I had a weekly game night that, uh, was comprised of about a dozen or so, uh, friends, local gamers and so forth who were real at the, uh, at the headwaters of every new development. And then whenever I went to a convention, uh, I, I pulled people to, to play the game as often as I could. So I'm always sitting down with new people and new players when the, when the opportunity is there. Definitely. Were you able to get to Gen Con this year? Um, I was not willing to get to Gen Con this year. Fair. It's a little <laughs> up in the air. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's good. At least we're starting to reintegrate back. So I was, uh, you know, pull us off the topic to, to a fun side uh, thing and, and maybe, uh, you know, looking at the development of uh, our careers as they go. But uh, it was funny to see, you know, your early kind of focus was nothing to do with games, but was juggling. So True. I want to ask you, I want to tell us a little bit about that. Uh, and then kind of, it's funny, your, the Wikipedia page reads very funny. It, it reads as if you, uh, you had an early career in juggling and then you were hired by Wizards of the Coast to juggle. <laughs> and I was like, oh, somebody needs to work on their grammar there. Yeah. But, uh, um, well, yeah. I did actually do a couple of juggling jobs for Wizards. I mean, you know, we're all friends here. It's a small industry. And um, <laughs> the Wikipedia page desperately needs work. There's a much more good, uh, much more girderer uh, bio <laughs> at um, Crab Fragment. Yeah. So forgot to go, go pick that up. But anyway, um, I started my professional career as an entertainer. I was a, a magician as a child. You know, I learned to juggle when I was like 13. Um, I, I spent my, my teens in the SCA, which is a medieval reenactment group where you get to dress up and play with swords and, and in my case, juggle at feasts and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, entertainment was just a thing that I liked, the thing I knew how to do. I went to engineering school, but on the weekends I went to St. Louis and juggled in the train station and, you know, passed the hat. And um, when I moved uh, to Seattle in 89, uh, I actually took on a pen name. James Ernest is not my real name because there were three, famous people in town with my real name, mm-hmm. a weatherman, a congressman, and a serial killer. And I didn't want to be <laughs> confused with any of them. Um, 
But I think what's important about this backstory is mm. that I'm an entertainer. And I think that is a part of game invention that can't be overlooked. Mm. I have to remember that the every game that we make is really about an audience experience. It has to be interpreted through their eyes and it has to be, you know, straight up entertaining for them. The yeah. cheap ass line specifically is about why it's about why am I playing this game? What is the joke on the front of this envelope? That's going to make me spend $5 to try what's inside of it. And therefore, what am I as a player pretending to do? So that's always been my uh, gateway to a new game is what am I about to pretend to do? Yeah. It's also uh, from a design standpoint, if you're actually modeling a real world system and you can tell your players what system that is, then they bring a whole bunch of rules in that you don't have to teach them again. Uh, as opposed to a purely abstract game that models nothing where you have to start from scratch, that's a harder learning curve. That's a bigger first step. Uh, and so when I say, you know, you're sneaking around a house trying to kill somebody, that helps me explain why when he can't see you, you can do stuff that you can't do when he does see you. Like, okay, that's just like when I really sneak around somebody's house. And try to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> you're channeling that, uh, that serial killer part of your, uh, your, Absolutely. Uh, your alternate personality. Too funny. And um, yeah, kind of as I, I've grown, it's interesting kind of reflecting back on, on just kind of education and what is important in, in that education and, and applying it to real world experience. And, and there's so many people that have that kind of story of, you know, of these specialties in such disparate uh, areas, you know, and how they apply it. And it really fascinates me. I mean, ultimately I graduated with a psychology degree. And so just kind of why people do the things they do is generally yeah. fascinating. And, to me. and people and, uh, can't even explain why they do the things they do. And, yeah. and that, you know, so it's psychology is a, is a crazy uh, science. Definitely. I tell you um, a lot of people come to game design through entertainment. More people, I think come to it through uh, math and the hard sciences and mm. I think that because the defining aspect of games is their mechanics, it's easy to forget that they have all these other aspects that they share with other media yeah. and to say be, that mechanics are the only thing that matters. And so there's a whole lot of game designers, especially, you know, when you meet new game designers who are coming at it from that perspective and they want to make a game and what they think a game is, is a set of rules, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, ignoring all the aspects of marketing and manufacturing, but just like here is a set of rules, uh, it is therefore a game. Like they sort of miss the experience that a player is having when they adopt the game, when they learn the game, when they teach the game, when they think about the game, yeah. you know, those are, those are often much more um, soft sciences than, than rules and numbers and, and writing. Yeah. And I think, you know, my recent, you know, game commitment has been flesh and blood and, and certainly a very well-designed card game. But what drew me to that game was the, the, value and the energy and effort they put into the competitive side, the organized play side, you know, because for me, I, I play games these days, mainly for the social side, you know, and mm -hmm. I pick games that I can resonate with and enjoy. Certainly, you know, that certainly helps me stick around, but, uh, but to see that. And, uh, and I think that that's something that I would like to see in battle tech, you know, I have my own ideas for kind of ways to kind of bring that into, into fruition. But, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, Battletech doesn't have is just that is an ease to get people together and, and play in kind of an organized fashion. And so that's something kind of in terms of me, in terms of my own, you know, personal goals and ideas. That's that's something I have on my my mind to kind of address is, is find that way to kind of bring people together. But it's good to and it's good to put that as a high level goal in your design yeah. plan. Like that doesn't happen automatically. You have to know you want it. Yeah. And you have to put in, I mean, the yeah, the 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 logistics of that and organizing that are incredible. You know, but as you right. said, it's, uh, you know, they, it is uh, two completely different worlds between designing and, and creating the game and actually um, distributing the game, producing the game. You know, it's, it's insane. And it's, uh, you know, it's somewhat, somewhat frustrating. Battletech's, you know, in a big resurgence now, you know, coming off a very successful Kickstarter two years ago. Um, and uh, it's interesting to me having run a business and kind of watch people give feedback and, you know, as customers and vent frustrations and, you know, share, you know, positive feedback as well as negative feedback of, uh, you know, it's, it's always amazed me how alien the reality of producing a product and getting it to, to market and delivering it to the customers 
how that reality is so alien to the consumer of that product and how <laughs> sure well and but yeah, they don't need to know how the sausage is made but yeah but uh yeah it's it's uh again you're delivering for them an experience they yeah. they see a game on a store shelf and they buy it and play it yeah i see it's it more enough. more on the empathy side and kind of managing expectations because you want people <laughs> yeah. to enjoy it you know and you don't want them to be like oh why isn't this on the shelf and it's like yeah. well that's because it's floating in the harbor off of california <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. that's that's why it is but uh yeah it's crazy so what's um you know what are you working on now you got a you got a game kind of in development or are you kind of in the design and play testing well, with your daughter um, at at the moment uh, I have several games. We just sent out the Crab Fragment uh, newsletter for this month, and mm-hmm. I have three games that are about to drop, and they're all sort of different shapes and sizes. But uh, the first one is called Vines, and it's a collection of trick-taking games. Um, speaking of Magic the Gathering style deck building, when you when you make a traditional style uh, trick-taking game, you, the, the deck construction rules are pretty simple. You just set up a rule and then build that deck, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but I've really enjoyed doing games in that category games that are with what is essentially a traditional style uh deck maybe five suits maybe six or three or whatever but whatever that in introduces to the games mm-hmm. uh vines is a set of trick taking games that i did for uh basically on spec like i do many times uh a project that finally just evaporated and now i have it and, and i love these games so that's coming out and i'm actually working on the art right now to get the cards ready for for a proof um, there is a, a city building game, sort of a tile laying game uh, called Copper Creek, which is actually like 15 years old at this point. It, it was just one of these back burner games that was never quite right. And this, this year we took it out and made it a little closer to right. Uh, so that's another game that will be a print and play, uh, on Crab Fragment pretty soon. And the other one is, I don't know if you're familiar with TAC. It's a game that I did out of a, a, a science fiction or fantasy novel uh, with Patrick Rothfuss that got me a few other uh, leads, including uh, this one called the Vertigris Pawn, which is a, uh, a YA uh, novel that just came out this summer. That is sort of chock full of references to this chess game. And the author of the book said, I would love it if this chess game was a real thing. And so we are about to drop the open beta rules for uh, fist is the name of the game. Uh, and, uh, it is a, a, a asymmetric chess variant. So, you know, the king has lots of uh, pieces and the challenger has a fewer pieces, but they can do more things. Okay. Um, and so that that is uh, another game where I don't have to manufacture it because you can play it with the chess set. So we're just putting the rules out. Um, the author's main objective is to have a set of rules that, that she can sort of share with the people who are reading the book my objective is of course to find a publisher for this thing and actually make some money on it yeah yeah <laughs> that'll happen after we get the rules down definitely so yeah i, I got a bunch of stuff uh, going on those are just the three uh, the three hottest topics right now and where do where do people find those what are the links and stuff uh crab fragment labs is the uh is the website crabfragment.com will get you there and uh that's all games by me mostly print and play some of them are also available uh from drive through carts Awesome. And is, is Crab Fragment kind of a subsidiary of Cheap Ass? You know, what's the relationship? That's a replacement. Uh, Cheap okay. Ass Games uh, got bundled up and shipped to St. Louis about two years ago. We took okay. uh, essentially a Greater Than Games is a, a game publisher in St. Louis, has done many things you have heard of. And we were looking to get out of the publishing business. Uh, luckily, before COVID, before, you know, okay. the, the, yeah. the most recent uh, shipping and, and manufacturing issues that came up, we said, at some point we have to retire. And so my wife and I uh, looked around for a publisher to take the catalog and, and greater than did they, uh, they continue now with those things. And uh, uh, crab fragment is full stop, brand new uh, stuff that, that didn't go out the door with that, uh, with that delivery. <laughs> gotcha. Excellent. And uh, you know, for people, for people out there that are listening, that are interested in kind of diving into the industry, you know, any kind of suggestions, you know, as a veteran kind of for people, you know, where do they go, you know, where to look, how to look, what kind of things to avoid kind of in the industry as publishing, as designing as developing, I think as designing, developing as designing, I, you know, the, um, the common wisdom is that to make a lot of games, you have to play a lot of games and I don't, 100% agree with that. I certainly have played a lot of games in my life and I continue to do that, but 
you can't really learn without also making a lot of games, like just literally crank them out. And that's why I tell people don't get distracted by selling it to a publisher. Don't get distracted by manufacturing it, make games. The first things that we did as game designers was kit bashing stuff. We already have. I changed the rules to every game in my house. I changed the rules to monopoly. I changed the rules to D and D. I changed the rules to chess, right? I just, you know, monkey with what you have, play it with people and see if it got better. And eventually learn those steps that take you from an idea in your head to a, a board game you can play with friends, but let it stop there and do that a hundred times. When I taught a game design class, I was just like, you're going to make a new game every week. We did, we did the every week for a whole semester. Just, just crank them out because you will learn a lot more finishing a lot of short projects than, than dragging yourself through one long project. Gotcha. Yeah. On the education side, are there specific fields and focuses that you find excel more? You know, I know you talked about kind of the math and engineering as, as one that people come into, but not necessarily the recommended one. You know, what, uh, what kind of backgrounds do you find, you know, create the best you, designers? It, it depends on what kind of game you want to make, right? Yeah, yeah. Games is such a broad category. Um, I have a background in math and entertainment. I'm a technical writer. I ha- I, I'm a graphic designer. I have sort of all the chops to, to make my own things. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't hurt to dip your feet in all of those things. You should at least, um, you know, read a little bit about math as it specifically applies to game design. I have some articles at Crab Fragment that, that sort of touch those areas. Um, I just posted a video uh, last year about graphic design for game designers, very specifically how to make prototypes that work better. It's not about finished products. It's just about laying out the information on a card, you yeah. know? Um, but, uh, but yeah, mostly you learn by doing and, and game design. If you're, if you're used to another creative process, like painting or writing or mm. almost any other form of art, you typically don't involve people in your process. You show them something that's done or close to done. Mm. You get editorial feedback, but you can't really get someone's feedback on your idea. Right. Um, the process of game design, at least for me, is much different from that because I will, I will workshop names of games. I will workshop core mechanics. I will put components in front of people and say, what would you do with these? Um, and that leads to much better products than if I sat at my desk writing a game down to its last details and then put it in front of somebody. That product always sucks. I, I did it a couple of years ago at uh, a convention. I wrote a, a card game that I, 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 I didn't have any testers. So I just wrote this whole thing mm-hmm. uh, and put it in front of people. And it was awful. And, and uh, you know, just one more reinforcement of for game design specifically to understand how people will approach what you're building and what they want to do with it, what they expect it to do. Um, you can put it in front of people pretty early in yeah. the development and they will help you a lot. Uh, so, so that's maybe the most important thing for a new designer to understand is that you cannot retire to an ivory tower and, and, and poop out a game. Right. You, you really have to, uh, put the structure in front of people, understand what they expect, take their feedback seriously. And the less you work on something, the less attached you are to it, the more likely it is you'll be willing to change it into mm-hmm. something better. You know, Because if you do work in that tower for a year and then put your game in front of somebody and they don't like it, you will just reject their feedback and move on to a tester who does. Like That's, that's, that's no way to run a railroad, right? Right, <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that resonates with one of my favorite quotes that I have as a professional is that, you know, perfection is the enemy of progress. And it, it seems like that's kind of, you know, that's exactly what you're saying. It's just like, absolutely. Get it, get the number one reason I procrastinate is fear of doing it wrong. And, and yeah. you just, you only overcome that by getting in there and getting your hands dirty. Definitely. Excellent. Well, I appreciate this conversation, James. Uh, before I sign off, are there, are there any uh, videos of you uh, showing your, uh, showing off your juggling skills? That we yeah, actually um, stuff. Um, you can find a lot of miscellaneous things on my YouTube channel. Uh, they're all linked from Crab Fragment, uh, mostly in the about page and yeah. uh, over on the, the lecture pages. Um, so yeah, it's a mix of travel videos with the family. Uh, there is a video of me juggling at a Ren Fair a few years ago. There is uh, a number of just how to how to make your own board games and 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 you know playing cards and so forth. And um, you should also check out my podcast, which I do every week. It's called Here All Week. And my my friend Kelly Wright and I decided that during the pandemic, we would sit down in front of a microphone uh, for half an hour every week and tell each other jokes. So that's... Uh, I love it. 
Yeah, uh, Renegade HPG is a COVID baby, so you know, yep. it's, uh, you know it's you know it was a good time for people to kind of come up and you know exercise some ideas. Definitely, and kind of get the podcast up and going. So, uh, what other what are the links for that? You know, uh, certainly people can find that on iTunes, Spotify, I assume, and uh, any kind of social media links that people can check out. In addition to uh, uh, Crab every, Fragment, everything front page at Crab Fragment. That's your uh, that's your Excellent. anchor for all that good stuff. Excellent. Well, I will definitely be checking that out and kind of exploring some of uh, some of those YouTube videos. So I appreciate your time, James. And uh, I know it's been fun. Get a little glimpse into BattleTech history and, and get a yeah, little insight for into me. kind of uh, how games are met. I appreciate. I it. wish that I could tell you uh, of all the years that I worked on that game, but sadly they were cut short. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, but it led to good things. It led to good things, and so a lot of good games have come out of you since. But uh, we appreciate it. Thanks, James. Thank you. Bye.